or that Awaska. Okay. So now I think you can hear, the, hear me even better. So I'm guessing it's going to be a bit hard to get your attraction at this time of the day because you're probably tired and I'm not going to be long. But first of all, I'm going to be introducing myself. My name is Adet, Adet Awaskar, and I'm a senior threat hunter in Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 for the past two and a half years now. Before that, I used to be a checkpoint SOC manager and at Veronis. And today, I'm going to be discussing with you an insider threat uh, use cases that we managed to find on our customer's environment. Uh, we're going to be discussing and I will be showing you how can you use your EDR logs, your endpoint detection and response logs, in order to target those two frequently seen use cases in, I'd say, at least 60 or 70 percent of, of our customer base. So uh, without further ado, let's just start. Um, so on the agenda today, we're going to start with defining the insider threat. We're going to give you some, at least try to set the grounds for this entire conversation. Then we're going to share with you a few real world, real world use cases that I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with at least one of them. We're going to deep dive into how and what we can do in order to spot them using your EDR logs, uh, Q&A, and we're going to wrap up the session with a few recommendations to everyone. So let's just begin. So a little bit about the team. We're a managed threat hunting team that's providing on threat hunting for our customers that is based on practically anywhere in the world. And this is done on top of Codex DR logs, which is Palo Alto's EDR. Obviously, you can do those type of hunting on any type of EDR that you own, and it doesn't, it is not limited to Codex XDR. So first of all, let's um, deep dive into who is, the, who is the insider, and let's try to define him. So. When you're thinking about a blue team, whatever is in our mind all the time is rats and ransomwares and APTs and vulnerabilities and those types of things are usually occupying the socks in the blue team's entire time. Now, there's also one thing that is always floating in the back of our head and it's called the insider threat. And I feel as personally, as, as a previous sock manager, that we always come short in detecting those insiders throughout our days. And in this use cases that I'm going to share with you, I hope that maybe some more blue teams around the world are going to be, are going to be utilizing those specific use cases in order to find those insider threats. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples why insider threats are a really big problem to organizations worldwide and essentially why they are so hard to detect. And essentially, they're so hard to detect because they're part of organ our organizations. It's we that gave them the credentials, and it's we that gave them the legitimate access to those systems and to those data, types of data that they need to interact with in order to do their job. And when you think about an, an insider threat or an insider, it can virtually be anyone. It can be... Um, a careless employee that sends an email mistakenly, but it can be much, much worse with a rogue business partner that, knit, that sits sorry, right next to you and decides to turn against the same organization that he is working for. So we'll start with a couple of examples. And I'm pretty sure that everyone in here probably recognizes the person in this picture on the left. So this is Edward Snowden. And this is the famous case of Edward Snowden versus the NSA. And the story begins on 2013 when Edward Snowden is getting hired by the NSA as an external contractor. And throughout his service in the NSA, he decides after 15 months of employment to steal a lot of data from the NSA. Top secret documents, approximately 1.7 million documents were alleged to be leaked by Edward Snowden. And obviously, this caused a whole lot of um, embarrassment to the Na National Security Agency of the United States. Um, how did he do it, you ask? He essentially had domain admin credentials, and he connected an external USB drive to one of the servers, which he then uh, leaked a lot of uh, documents from this specific server. Um, another example, before we dig into the technicalities, um, the Anatcom and the Uri Blau affair. Uh, 
uh, I'm guessing that this is one, probably one of the mousses that is less known here in the crowd, but this is a really famous uh, case in Israel. And in 2005, Anat Kam was assigned to work as a clerk in the Israeli command office center. She was just a regular soldier, and Uri Blau is an Israeli Haaretz newspaper that is specialized in military affairs. Um, throughout, his, throughout her military service, Anat Kam has decided to copy thousands of classified documents, including many uh, confidential documents also, to a, an external CD drive this time. This was quite a while ago where USBs were not as popular. And then after she finished her, um, her service, she took that specific USB with her, later on leaked it to um, the journalist Uri Blau, which eventually uh, published some of the documents in Haaretz newspaper. Later on, on January 2010, Anatkam was indicted with espionage, and she actually uh, served and was sentenced to four and a half years in, pri in prison and 18 months of probation. So with all this background being laid out, let's start with the first use case that I'm gonna sh be sharing with you. And th the first one is going to be called living somewhere. Um, so let's just read and go through the life cycle of, an ins of a classic insider threat. It all begins with a new employee being recruited to the team and he is assigned with a legitimate account to perform its daily tasks. Later on, as time moves on, the employee is granted with more and more permissions to different types of systems and various data types that he needs to do in or because he's participating in some more project or some new uh, teams that he's engaging with. And this is something that happens essentially to all of you, I'm guessing, as well. Later on comes the termination phase, and this can be a dual part termination. It can either be the employee spending to leave the company because he decided to move on to another, to a, to another company, or, he's, or this is the company's decision to fire him. And this is exactly where the data exfiltration takes place. A few days prior to the last day of the employee, he moves on to connect a personal USB drive to his or her machine and copy internal data to this specific disk drive. Now, let's do an anonymous survey. I wanted you to raise your hand if you ever copied a, um, data from your own <laughs> past employer when you left. All right, so <laughs> there's some courage people in here because, so first of all, I'm guessing that no one has actually fell into this because when we were doing it internally in Palo Alto, a couple of people were actually raising their hand and we were saying, is someone taking notes? I mean, we should be kind of taking notes for the next time that they're gonna leave. So no one's gonna admit it, but I'm guessing that if we're really honest, probably a lot of us have probably did that along, our, along the way. So what I'm going to be providing with you, first of all, is some example of reports. Every, obviously, everything that is customer-related is obfuscated in here, but just I'll give you a high level of what is this report is all about. So the managed threat hunting team has managed to find over the past three months, three users that have copied excessive amount of data to an external USB drive. You can see one and a half gigabytes of data, 5.1 gigabytes of data, and 15 gigabytes of data. The key uh, finding in this specific report is not the amount of data that was copied, but the fact that for the last 90 days, uh, for the last 45 days, sorry, no login event was, sp was spotted for this specific user. And this may hint that this user is no longer part of the organization. The second part of this um, report is followed by highlighting to the customer what is the type of data that was being leaked? So we can see a couple of really interesting, uh, interestingly named directories like clients which contains 5,000 suspected internal company documents, my appeals, again, a lot of company documents alleged that are containing in this specific directory, and IP dump. Now this was a really big law firm company which later on confirmed to us that indeed those directories were containing internal documents. Another example, uh, another user that has copied 1.8 gigabytes worth of data to an external USB drive from a directory that is called 
FDA submission. This was a really large pharmaceutical company. And again, when looking through the copy event, obviously, FDA submission is highly suspicious when we're looking at this event. So how do we create those type of reports? So we're going to use two queries. And in this specific um, screenshot, what you, what you can see is, is, a, is, a, is a screenshot of an XQL query. XQL is a proprietary language of uh, Palo Alto Networks, but you can use it at any EDR that you own. It can be either Splunk or, any, or CrowdStrike or anything similar to that. And with that query, we were doing a couple of things. We have the first query that is going to get a list of all the users that copied data to an external USB drive and, were, and did not observe login for the last 45 or 90 days. You can just adapt it to any um, duration of time that you would like. This is what we call the lead generation query. We're going to get all the leads to our further hunting efforts based on query number one. Then we're going to go to query number two. And query number two is all about getting an idea on interesting files or folders that were spotted throughout the copy event. So this is query number one, and this is the lead generation query. And we're going to use the following output columns in order to make our life easier. Last login, when was the last timestamp where the user has logged in to any systems, any system that we actually have logs for? USB connecting number of days. This is the unique amount of days that this specific user has connected a, US, a USB drive to his machine throughout the query period. And this is just to show you how often is this user is prone to connect USB drive to his machine, part of his regular job or not. Total amount of emails that were copied throughout the event, total amount of documents, total amount of images, total amount of code, and total amount of gigabytes and count of the unique files that were copied throughout the event. All of these columns are designed in order to generate and make our life easier in picking those um, highly suspicious leads where we're going to run the second query on top of. And this is, the this is an example of the output of the query. I know it's in, uh, it's in dark mode, so it's really, really hard to see. I hope that you can see it. But you have the query highlights right above. So the user's last login was July 13th. And this was, ex this was a query that was executed around um, December 2021. So for quite a while, the user did not log into any system of this specific customer's environment. Over the past 90 days, the following USB properties were spotted. So the user has connected only on one day. I mean, for only one day, the user connected a USB device to his machine. A total, a total amount of 1.8 gigabyte was copied over 1.1K unique files. And the file type breakdown says that two email file types were copied, 85 file type, 85 images, sorry, 102 code files, and 646 uh, documents. So following this really good lead, and you can see the output in here. This is the drive letter, the username, which is masked, and all of this type of data that is lied on the query itself. This is where we're going to pivot to query number two. And query number two is analyzing the copy. And again, the columns are here to help us understand better what was copied out throughout this event. So one of them is the timestamp, which is obviously the timestamp of the copy, the full path of the file that was copied, the username, the drive letter, the host name, and the file size, which are all, the, all, which are all pretty straightforward. This is an output of the second query, and this is related to the first query that we just saw with the FDA submission. So you can see that the drive uh, that a directory called FDA submission was copied to a USB drive a few days prior to the user's termination. So while we were experiencing the feedback that we got, we sent a lot of um, those type of reports to customers and it essentially happens on every environment that doesn't block USB drive. So one thing that we recommend to our customers is maybe enforce a USB block and just open the USB to those people who need it to be part of their actual work. 
and if this is something that you will not be able to enforce in your organization, so we highly recommend you to have those queries or those similar type of queries running in your environment regularly just to spot them even if it happens after the user gets, is getting terminated. I mean, for us as Blue Team, when a specific file leaves our environment and it doesn't matter if it's a physical copy or an online copy, it usually means game over in a way. But then again, we had a lot of customers that were reaching out to users after their termination and starting uh, kind of a legal actions against them because they took and they violated company policy with doing that. Okay, so this is something that is really key. And while you're all reading the feedback, do you have any questions while I'm drinking some water? So the second use is, is called uploading somewhere. And it is very similar to the first use case. You can see that the life cycle that is laid out in front of you is, is extremely similar to the first one with one exception. Instead of connecting a USB drive to your host, you're gonna link it to one of the online drives and the third party vendors that are, aligned, are, that are allowing external storage for people that are gonna use it. So a couple, one, Two report examples with two key differences, which I'm gonna highlight for you. So one of them, you can see that over the past three months, a user was spotted to upload 5.7 gigabytes to OneDrive. And again, the last login for that user was spotted 45 days in earlier. Now, notable directories that were spotted throughout the copy event is archive.pst. A PST file is uh, probably Microsoft Outlook's um, internal mailbox file and it probably cop and contains an internal copy of the user's email backup including a lot of stuff that we probably don't want to leave the organization so this is the output of the copy again now highlighting the uh, process that actually initiated this specific upload towards the cloud in this case we have onedrive.exe Another example is when you're, when, when you're hunting for customers or essentially in your environment, you have an idea on what is the allowed third party software that this specific organization allows their users in order to use for cloud storage. So for example, on Palo Alto Networks, we're using Google Drive. And in this specific company, we saw that OneDrive is something that is fairly used by in this specific organization which made us to believe that OneDrive was the authorized third-party vendor that this specific company has chosen. Not to mention that the remote host that this, the OneDrive is uploading the data to is the domain is called SharePoint.com. But luckily enough for us, Microsoft also um, registers a subdomain which is masked in here which you will be, which is, which is owned by this specific company. So in here, for example, if Palo Alto was to use OneDrive in order to store their file, it would have been paloalto.my.sharepoint.com. And when, to me as a threat hunter, this is a really key and important investigation point because I can whitelist everything that goes out to this specific subdomain. I'm guessing that this is allowed uh, allow, an allowed connection that is done by uh, OneDrive. But in here, you can see at this specific account that Google Drive, Dropbox were used throughout the organization, not to mention that using this technique of the remote host, you'll be able to determine if a user is connected with his personal OneDrive. Because when you're gonna be connecting with your, use, your, with your personal OneDrive, your data get, is getting uploaded to a different domain and not the company-owned domain. So again, this is an example of the query, and you can see that those processes that are responsible for uploading a lot of data towards uh, bolt.dropbox.com and Google APIs, uh, googleapis.com, which um, belongs to Google Drive Sync and dropbox.exe. So how to create the report? So again, we're gonna use two queries. 
really similar to our first assumptions, getting a list of all the users, this time who uploaded data to third party vendors, and their last login was set to back in the past. The second query is gonna help us in understanding what are the type of files that are being executed. So again, very, very similar. I'm not going to bore you with again, but last login date, number of unique uh, uploaded days where the user is actually uploading stuff to the cloud, total amount of emails, documents, images, code, total amount of gigabytes, and unique files that were spotted. The query number two is to help you analyze the copy again. And this is where the Q&A comes. And if you want, do we want to do the Q&A at the end? Because I have a wrap-up. All right, so I'm gonna s jump straight to the wrapping up. So wrapping up. So blue teams, it's really easy to focus on the, on, on the outside. I mean, if I would have an anonymous survey in here and, and ask you if you're a member on, the, on a blue team, what concerns you the most? I'm guessing that ransomware would be number one, followed by, I guess, uh, crypto miners and some uh, botnets and, and rats, but nobody would have mentioned the inside of threat. Now, there's a real, if you're gonna Google some really interesting cases over the past few, few months even, there are a lot of cases where insiders from really popular companies like even Google and Tesla, or there were a lot of cases where it really affected the company and made them pay millions of dollars to just counteract those activities that are made by the insider threats. One another thing, and this comes from me to you, um, in a data-driven world, where everything essentially that we're doing is being documented, um, don't borrow stuff with you when, you when you leave a company, because essentially we can see everything. And again, if you would like a copy of the queries, again, this is XQL based, so if you have Palo Alto, Alto Networks, Cortex XDR, you'll be able to use them out of the box, but if not, it's just a general idea on how to build them, then you can adapt them to your own EDR language. So please don't, re don't hesitate to reach, to reach out. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to do so on LinkedIn, Twitter, or anything similar that you feel free to. So thank you very much for having me. And the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, I'll do it. Yeah, I was wondering whether waiting for 45 or 90 days isn't too late. Uh, is it by informing the customers in real time about these events, is it too false positive uh, of an uh, approach? So that's actually an excellent question. The problem is when you have third party hunters is that we don't have the ability to know who's pending to leave the company. So for some of the customers that we actually reported it to, we build a process that actually, um, they're gonna send us the people that are pending to leave and we would run those queries before the alleged date of this specific user that is going to be leaving. If you're working for a company and you're um, threat hunting for a company, for your internal company, then you don't have the, you have the ability to contact your HR and have them send you all the employees that are pending to leave or even worse, ones that are getting terminated soon. So this is gonna be, uh, but, but this, this, this is a good, a good comment because you, when you're sending something that happened three months ago, it's usually a little bit problematic in terms of the customer. Uh, thanks for the, for the talk, really great talk. Uh, just out of curiosity, you said that uh, when your clients like, receive the report, they could maybe sue that, uh, that employee that stole the data. Um, I don't know if maybe if you know the answer, but is like the data from your report is applicable at court for them to sue, but maybe they didn't record it, the, all the data that is, is transferred. So again, an excellent question, and thank you. So the thing is, I'm not sure they will be able to utilize our report, but our reporting also includes the queries themselves. And the queries queries their data that they're saving on, on uh, Palo Alto's cloud. And if they're gonna use those queries in order to get the output from the Palo Alto's cloud, it's, it's applicable to court. It, it, it aligns with all the data regulations that are needed and they can just provide the output query and I'm guessing it, it stands in court, I guess. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? 
Okay, in that case, once again, thank you to Oded and his young assistant. Thank you.